Good evening. We're going to start. For those of you who don't know me, and that's probably not too much of our crowd, I'm Dean of Architecture and Construction Management, Kurt Hunker. And it's my pleasure to do this introduction because tonight's speaker, who is uh, the last in our fall lecture series, is certainly no stranger to New School. For many years, Ralph Rosling was a key member of this faculty. He taught design studios, introductory classes, and others. He edited many issues of Cartouche, the school's design paper. He served as design chair when chairs oversaw content areas when we were an architecture-only school, uh, rather than programs. And as they say, he has been around. In addition to all that, Ralph has managed one of San Diego's most successful design firms for decades, Rosling Nakamura Terada Architects, from their beginnings almost 40 years ago. Is that right? 40 years ago. Designing houses and additions, they have grown into an award-winning office, creating schools, civic centers, libraries, and much more. The, fir the firm expanded several years back to maintain a Ventura office, and it is still handling work, and Ralph tells me they are busy. Academically, after leaving New School, Ralph has taught design studios as a visiting professor at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, and has served as visiting critic at Kansas State and Texas. And in addition to all of that, he has lectured around the globe. I worked with Ralph years ago, and I can tell you with assurance that no one in the profession in San Diego works harder at design than he. That is surely part of the reason why the work is so consistently good project after project, time after time. It is my pleasure to welcome him back to New School. Please join me in welcoming Ralph Rosling. Can everybody hear me okay? Can you hear me back there? All right, yeah, good. I don't know what to say after that. Um, well, thank you very much, Kurt. That was, that was heartfelt. Um, I think what I'm gonna do tonight is maybe something a little different. Um, I'm gonna present work that's intrigued us um, by the masters and uh, some contemporary architects and talk about um, what it is about that work that intrigues us. And I'm gonna make it even more personal because I'd like to talk to you all about what is interesting to me and, and, and when we do our work, you know, what are the themes that we're, we're trying to go after and uh, and then got on to showing some projects. And I think what I'm gonna do on the projects is go more quickly through them and, um, and then save, save the commentary on the projects to the very end. I'd love to hear, hear your comments on the work. So um, we'll see how that format works out. Um, so architecture for us is really a pursuit of ideas. And the ideas are about expression and um, trying to find the right expression for each project to make them meaningful. Um, you know, each project has a blend of a client's aspirations. There's usually a site somewhere, but not always. Sometimes it's furniture or something else. Um, there are conditions, there's usually constraints, there's usually some some kind of limitation that becomes maybe an opportunity. Um, but we try to make um, a unique blend of those things and express them. So this idea of expression is very important to us and a thing that we, thing that we talk about a lot in our office. Um, and our goal really is to bring artful expression into everyday life. And in Japan, that's a big thing. If you, if you ever travel to Japan, 
you'll notice that there's a lot of art in everyday life. And I think that's something that's really rubbed off on me with my two Japanese partners. So uh, here we go. So um, my training before architecture school was actually in, in painting and sculpture. I started off um, as, a, as an art major at Arizona State. And um, I was totally immersed in, in that. And uh, my mother uh, was a watercolorist, a fantastic watercolorist. And so she, you know, just growing up, it was like a continual art history class, you know, with my mother always talking about art. And my father was an inventor, and he said, you know, you really, you know, you really should think about art as a hobby. And, and maybe do something else, you know. But, but uh, so it, anyway, the, the, the story is that uh, in the beginning, I was really interested in light and material and the kind of mood that it makes and the kind of atmosphere that it makes. And I think it's really kind of the starting place for me when I, when I think about a project, I think about what is, what is the quality of the light? What is the ambient place? like and the and the light in that place and how how is it going to be controlled how is it going to be orchestrated into an experience and it started off in newport beach where i grew up this is actually not newport beach this is stinson beach but newport beach was a lot like this um, foggy from time to time and i loved this this layer of fog and this idea of of not knowing you know, what's beyond this mystery that fog creates and, uh, and the layers of experience that when you walk around in the fog like this, I love, I love that. And I think in a lot of ways it's influenced, you know, what, I, what I'm all about now. And then uh, we moved to the desert. My, my father's business actually went to the desert and talking about uh, an extreme change, you know, the quality of light in the desert is, is so different and so strong and so pervasive. Uh, it, it really, it's, it makes silhouettes, it makes shadows, it makes, it makes a lot of glare and you have to figure out how to deal with the glare. Um, it's, it was a dramatic change in my life and I'm still trying to figure out how to build in the desert. Um, and then I started getting interested in how material actually interacts with light. And this is from being in the sculpture classes and actually working with material. Um, and I think it, I think Louis Kahn would say that material is, is really spent light. And I, I really like that idea. And the best example that I've seen in recent time is this building in Tucson that uh, Richard and Bauer did where this copper facade is just, it's basically lighting up from the sunset. And uh, it just, it resonates. It just resonates with the sky and the sunset. So that kind of phenomenon, <clears throat> I'm, I'm thrilled. If we could pull something like that off, we, we love it. Um, and Corbu was a painter as well as an architect. And he really understood this idea of composition and uh, shadow and texture and color and how all those things can unfold on a building, um, especially as you move through the space. And um, I started getting interested in Corbu actually before I decided to be an architect because I was interested in the, in the um, painting that he was doing. And um, then I, I started to get interested in the buildings. And just recently, I went to La Tourette and was able to stay overnight and experience this place. And it really is magnificent. And uh, so we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. The other thing that's interesting is when light actually comes through a material. So kind of the opposite, when the lantern, lantern kind of effect that you can get with light moving out. And so um, I, went, I went to Japan not too long ago and saw the, 
the Herzog de Marin uh, project in a Modesano. Uh, and at night, it, it has this amazing glow. That's the image on the, on the left. And the image on the right, I'm really proud of. This was a student project that I gave. And I said, I would like you all to make a lantern that could become the beginning idea for a building. And so this student actually took a block of wood and did um, a series of micro microscope slides and stacked them and put a light source in the bottom. And uh, this, this thing glowed in a, in a most elegant way. And you could almost see that turning into a building very, in, you know, very easily. So this idea of light moving through material and coming out is, is also very intriguing to us. And then <clears throat> ultimately, it's this idea of light coming into a room and making a room, make, making us being able to perceive a, an indoor space. And so light actually comes in, hits objects, and, and uh, we start to understand the, the space when our eyes adjust to that. I'm getting over a cold, so bear with me on my, my raspy voice. It's, it's <clears throat> I wish I was over it. Anyway, um, so we have Rembrandt and we have Vermeer here. And, and uh, I was very, very influenced by the beauty of these paintings. And I think it was the, the amazing contrast that that when light comes through and starts to reveal something that has a, um, a hot spot and a shadow, this is a very dramatic and very emotional thing. So back to, back to Corbu and, and um, the chapel at La Tourette, you can kind of see how this, you know, this idea, you start to transform it into architecture and it really gets dramatic and it really gets interesting <clears throat> the way that you admit light into a space and how, how that can um, direct where you're going to go, where you're going to sit, and how you're going to be, be um, moving through the space. And then this idea of light um, hitting objects inside of, a, of space and, and uh, uh, revealing color, revealing texture, and the composition. So you can see this idea of painting um, in Corbu translating into three-dimensional space. Uh, you, you can see that transition. And it's very intriguing to us, and we, we talk about it a lot in the office. And this idea of, of sun hitting a building and um, playing with the, the form of a building, you know, the massing, the masses in sunlight that, that uh, Corbu talked about, and how, how it reveals an experience, both outside and then you go inside, and this is Rochamp, as you all know, um, inside the, you know, your eyes take time to adjust, and now all of a sudden you have another whole experience, very, very different. And, um, and very, very intimate. And I'm, I've always been fascinated by this, this procession of coming up the long road, walking up, moving around the building, finding the entry, going inside, and then experiencing this on the inside. It's incredible experience. If you haven't done it, you gotta do it, and you gotta walk the whole thing. It's really, really important. And then, <clears throat> We've always loved Louis Kahn's work, and of course Salk is right here for us to look at, but here, here's the Kimball uh, Museum, and he found a way to introduce light and admit light in a way that dematerializes concrete. It, it now becomes something else. It's not concrete anymore. It's, it's turned into something else. And, uh, and then the light actually filters down and makes an interesting quality for all of these sculptures. And it's, it's hard to photograph these spaces because the light, your camera doesn't adjust the way that your eye adjusts. So, you know, the, the, the way that the sculpture is actually bathed in light is very different than this photograph when you're actually looking at it. 
And I find that to be fascinating. And so the next thing is just, what is, what is the concept of a project? What are the intentions? How, how, do you, how do you start to talk about a dialogue of intentions and a narrative for a project? I think that's very important to us and finding those things. And some more examples, um, we love this CESA project, the pools next to the, next to the ocean, you know, a very simple dialogue of man-made geometry next to the coast, you know, which is very organic. So you have this contrast of the two, but doing it in a very succinct way because the budget was, was very tight on this project. And uh, we, we, love, we love this project because it is so succinct. And uh, Peter Zumthor's Baths and Balls is another one of our favorites. If you haven't gone here, you need to get on a plane and go to Switzerland and, and bathe in this place. It's, it's really amazing. So it's this experience of going from bath to bath in, into different kinds of baths with different aromas, different temperature, inside and outside, and, and having these walls that are the stone that are, are from the mountains right, right there, and the light that comes down to reveal that stone. It's just, it's just amazing. Highly recommend it. And then Salk, um, this, this monastic idea, um, you know, of a place for creativity, a place to try to understand life and the peculiarities of, 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 of uh, biology, you know, the, the symmetry and the asymmetry of, of um, space, which is, which is fascinating. And uh, the way that it focuses on the ocean and makes this environment, um, you know, words are, words are really hard to put to this project. And that's why we, we wanna talk about it because it's so amazing. But uh, there, are, there are stories for these projects. Every single one of these projects has an intention and a story, and I think that's very important. Um, so another thing that we really like, and I think a lot of this comes from my partners, this idea of making and making with a high level of craft. And so again, we're gonna go to Peter Zumtor, this little chapel that he did uh, in Switzerland, where every every piece has been uh, beautifully crafted, the skin, the structure, the benches, the the altar, um, the framing of the roof. Um, you you walk around this building and you want to touch and you want to smell and you want to feel all all of the elements. It's beautifully made. And then uh, Scarpa. You know, and, and a stair, a simple stair, a seemingly simple stair, and a Scarpa project where, you know, it's a stair, but it's also an event, and it's beautifully crafted. It's crafted to the nth degree. And one of the things that was great about Scarpa is he would get craftsmen working with him, and he kept working with the same craftsmen. And we actually have that tradition here in San Diego. Jim Brown is, I can, I can tell you that he uses the same crafts people and others do as well. And there is something to that actually, developing this relationship with craftsmen and having them add something to the project. Okay, so I, I'm gonna come out and say it. I, I, love, I love machinery and especially when it's beautiful. So here is a they call this a round case 750 Super Sport Ducati, and I think it kind of speaks for itself. Look at, look at the beautiful um, different kinds of metals coming together in the composition of that. It's, it's amazing. Industrial art at its best. Um, back to Corbu, this idea of spatial experience and, ex and orchestrating it, and we, we tend to want to look in our, in our library and look at these things and try to understand them <clears throat> and apply them from time to time. 
So here is here's Corbu's Villa Savoy, one of my favorites. And the plan, the plan is a, such an interesting plan. You know, the more you look at it, the more the more geeky you get about it, right? But it's 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 you know orchestrating experience in a very magnanimous way. It's allowing you to kind of go many different directions. And as you move through the plan, you see framed views, you see points where um, the perspective is very, very interesting. It's not a normal, it's not a normal view. And I asked a student to actually do uh, a, a project looking at the circulation through the volume of Villa Savoy, and this is, this is what came out of that exercise. I think it's pretty fascinating. But here, you know, there's no way you can capture this project, but there are some attempts at different, different moments within this space. You know, moving up the ramp, reaching um, an indoor outdoor space, and then all those ribbon windows actually frame a beautiful view. Um, this is probably one of the most important ones for us, and especially because we practice in California, and that is what is what is the narrative of the site and the place, and how does that start a conversation about where we're going with the project? Um, we we really think that that's an important thing if you're going to be a regional architect, and we we have we fancy ourselves as regional architects, so this. This idea of place is very, very important. And so what is place? Well, first of all, you have to go there. I mean, what, if you're an architect and you're assigned a project, you actually have to go and hang out there and stay and, and see what happens, see how the sky acts, see, see what the night is like, what the day is like. I think that's really important. And you need to understand the flora and the fauna, you need to understand the, the geography, uh, the history of the land, it's very, very important. And one of the things that I love to look at is, you know, how, how have people been using the land? Um, is, it, is it an agricultural place? Is there a special place where people hang out? And why, why are those chairs there? And um, those kind of things fascinate me. Another way you can investigate place is to actually draw it, go and sketch, and really try to understand you know, what you're looking at and try to capture the spirit of, of the place through drawing. And um, these, these two are, are kind of unusual because I usually like to write a whole bunch of notes on these things, but because I think that that's really the best thing to do is to put notes right on your sketch to record what you're experiencing so you can look at it later and go, wow, okay, I get it. Uh, watercolor is a way to interpret even further. Um, I, I like to think of watercolor as a way to exaggerate uh, what is really interesting in a, in a place. So you can, you can put more color than than what you're actually seeing to, to get the idea across. And uh, it's, a, it's a great transformative media to go from understanding a place to getting to a concept of what you're gonna do next. And I believe photos are also the same, the same thing. If you put together collage, collages of photos along with sketches, and all those things start to point you in a direction. What are you, what are you doing with your site, with your place that you're, you're working with? And I think of a place as something much bigger than your site. It's, a, it's usually a community or a region. And understanding the culture and the history is just going to give you a richer beginning to your project. And then, um, you know, we encourage this kind of, quick napkin sketch uh, mentality where, you know, if you're immersed and you're looking at situations and, you, you know, you start to get a feeling for what the massing should be, we, we actually 
start to do these napkin sketches and notebook sketches to get to get ideas going. And sometimes they're super messy like this one. And that's good for us, actually. It's kind of, it starts the conversation. And we'll make, we'll make study models, little tiny study models that are equally messy, that are easy to change when we're at this point. Um, another one that we talk about a lot is the beauty of things that are pared down to the essence. And a lot of times it's a utilitarian kind of essence. If a, if a client wants something uh, on a very, very tight budget and it's, and it's gotta be very functional, um, it can be extremely elegant. So here's the Wright Brothers glider, you know, pretty, pretty essential. Bicycle, Ron, you'll like this one. Um, you know, how essential can you be? You know, bicycle is a beautiful, beautiful expression of that idea of something essential. Or a, a car, a race car usually is, is the best example. Um, something that can't have extra weight, has to be minimal, has to be durable, last a long time, a thousand miles. Uh, has to be aerodynamic. You know, you start to put all those, all those functional constraints and you start to get something very, very beautiful if you're, if you're really trying to solve that problem very, very carefully. <clears throat> and then to something architectural, we love, we love these spaces that are just big, interesting warehouse spaces that are very essential, that bring light in and have a very, very straightforward kind of construction or structure. Um, we, we love hangars, we love um, concourse buildings, we love um, big warehouses, uh, factory space. We think, think those things are just marvelous. Okay, so now we're gonna, we're gonna get into our work. So what, what I want you to do is, is to compare this earlier discussion with the projects and see if, it, if there's any thread going through. So here we are in San Diego, all of us. Um, this is kind of, it's not really a checklist, but it's the things that we like to talk about on a project. And it's kind of a summary of the things that we, we've just gone through. But we, um, we, like to, we like to talk about these items when we start. So here's a house that we did in Del Mar. Uh, it's pretty close to the ocean. It's about two miles away from the ocean. Um, overlooks, it's actually a, a site that's shrouded by trees, kind of an interesting site. Uh, it has a, um, a place where you can see out to the ocean. And the, the project actually uh, was an addition to uh, Henry Hester Got to find the button here. Here we go. So this lower portion of the house uh, was done by Henry Hester, and and the clients asked us to do a second floor on the Henry Hester house. Pretty daunting uh, request, and so we started looking at this planar composition, and we thought, okay, maybe maybe it can be just a simple idea of a floating roof and have that roof actually control the sun in a way where it's in direct light up here. Um, and this, what was great is the site having tall trees all around it, it, it really kept, uh, kept the privacy discussion kind of under control. So, and uh, one of the things that we, we were strive for in this project was um, making an interesting entry. So uh, they, they have developed this garden uh, and sculpture area even more since these pictures have been done. But basically you walk by this and then you move towards, towards the entry. Uh, and then this is the addition up here. And uh, some of the things that we did to control the, the uh, the inside of the space is we made a very tall atrium that lets the warm air out 
and draws the cool air in, and it actually it actually works very very well. And uh, this this entry area here has a little fountain next to it that that aerates the air, and uh, the cool air actually moves into the house here. This door can open up, and it pulls through the, the entire house. So this, this is that fountain, and uh, this is a pivoting door here that could stay open. This fountain is right here. And the view from up above, and the atrium kind of blending into um, the, the ground plane and opening up. And this was done on a very, very tight budget, this project. And what it looks like at night. Um, the next one is the house that we proposed to, in uh, the desert, right near Palm Springs. And we had this idea of a line in the desert, much like a petroglyph. Uh, here's the site, uh, San Jacinto, uh, beautiful, beautiful scenery backdrop. And the house, this idea of the line in the desert is the house actually becomes this datum so you read the desert topography against the datum of the house. We thought that, that was a pretty interesting thing. Um, this pool is on the west side and the breezes come from the west and there are uh, ways that the water is sprayed into the air here to cool the air and that comes through the house. Um, this is an adjustable shade on the south. So in the winter time, you, you can pull it back, and in the summertime, you can pull it out. So you can adjust the glare and the, and the uh, solar exposure on the south. And one of, the, one of the things about the desert is it really is good to minimize your east, your west and your east exposure. That's something we, we know. So looking at the plan, the walls really do kind of temper the light on the north side. So this, these are really bringing in an indirect balancing light and, and the south side has got uh, apertures that bring in more light. So the glare has to be controlled here, but this balances these, these openings on the side. And there's, there's actually more water involved with this project. There's a little, whoops, sorry about that. There is another small pool here that actually uh, cools this area of the house. And so the program is very simple, pool, living, and sleeping. Very, very straightforward. And cross section, uh, very, very, very skinny house, but tall. So it has, has kind of an interesting proportion. And the, the chimney actually is another way to pull the air through. It relieves the warm air. And um, the, uh, this shading actually moves in and out to control the sun. And one of the things we like to do is build big models. And uh, these days, we, we do quite a bit of 3D printing. But back, back at this point in time, we actually hand built these models. And we took this out actually out put it on the site, and we really looked carefully at how the shadows were working, where the trees are, how, and we started moving things around to get it to really work the way we hoped it would work on the site. Something we'd like to do. And probably some of you have seen this project. Uh, we we uh, had a great time doing this project. We were very fortunate to be hired to do the La Jolla Shores lifeguard station, and the site is a beautiful site right at La Jolla Shores. Um, this was the original lifeguard station that, that was blocking everybody's view, and our site is over here. So we came up with this idea. Um, a lot of us worked with the community, and we brought little tiny study models to the community, and they actually picked this version with the stair going up to a little platform at the top, which dematerializes the idea of a tower. 
and then the two masses split apart, so it's not so bulky. So it makes a plan that's very functional for the lifeguards. There's, there's the lifeguard side, the lockers and changing area, and their day room here where they can actually move out quickly to the beach. And then this is the community side here with uh, medical treatment and so on on the side. Uh, and then the stairs go up to the observation tower at the top. And it takes you down very quickly. Oh, this turned. Rats. Well, everybody turn your head now, okay? So the way that, the way that this project works in terms of structure is this is a mat slab, and it balances this arm because this has an overturning moment like so, but this this mat slab actually resists that turning. And there's, we did this kind of cheating structural piece here. So the cantilever is really only from here to here, but um, visually it's got this idea of a cantilever. I didn't catch that, the turn. Sorry about that, everybody. And we worked, we worked with Hector Perez through this project. He was, he was sort of our um, in-house uh, devil's advocate, and uh, it was very, very fun working with him. He did some beautiful sketches of this project. And it was a very, very fun process. And one of the things that we're very proud of is it actually really becomes a gateway to the, to the beach, especially when um, you go at off hours. It's, it's pretty iconic and pretty nice. Um, we've done a lot of nature centers. It's kind of one of our project types that we tend to do a lot of. And this one um, we're pretty proud of. We, we actually experimented with rammed earth on this. And this is in the Laguna Hills. And um, the idea behind it is really telling the story of the place, uh, including the history, um, the ranching, the, the um, Native, Native Americans earlier than that and uh, the flora and the fauna. And so the site is here. Um, this is the 73. But what's interesting about it is there is kind of a, a glimpse to the city. So we wanted to, to acknowledge that there is actually a city nearby, and we, we allowed that view to happen, and then uh, really isolated the view on on a lot of the natural features. And we worked with, with Andy Spurlock on this project, always a good thing, um, Spurlock uh, landscape architects. And he did this beautiful drawing, helping us to understand where, where to site this building in relationship to these dwarf um, sycamore and, and making almost a theater out of that. So um, it really becomes like a big room, if you will. All of this is a room, and, and this nature center is part of this bigger room. And it's also part of this trail system that goes all the way back and through. And uh, the meadow really becomes this foreground piece as you arrive to the, to the uh, nature center. And one of the things that we did, which I think was pretty successful, is we tucked the nature center behind this landform. So as you arrive, you really don't see this thing right away. You, it emerges. So when you park and you walk, you finally see this thing, um, this building, and then you realize, oh, I'm supposed to go here and then get on the trail. So you can, you can actually bypass the whole experience of going into the nature center and just get on the trail and go. Or you can be part of this shorter trail and come back around and go in to the nature center and see what's going on. So it kind of immerses you into this, this idea of hiking. The, the building becomes part of the hiking trail, which we were pretty, pretty um, that was part of the ideas that we were playing with. And then we, we really thought of the building as being almost like a labyrinth where you come up a very, very shallow 
slope next to the rammed earth wall and you, it makes you want to touch this wall and experience it with your hand. And then you move to this, um, I would call this a linear deck. And the entry is right here. And when you come in, you actually go back. You, you turn around and you go back and you can feel the inside of this, this rammed earth wall and then come back through the spaces again. So it's, it's this interesting kind of labyrinth um, experience. This is the rangers' um, quarters over here and the restrooms. And then this linear deck is really um, something for the painters. So there, there's plain air painters that come to the site and, and paint. So that, that was part of the program for this project. Um, so here, here's the cross section um, relief for warm air again, uh, PV panels, the rammed earth. This is shaded in the summertime and the winter sun actually hits it and allows the heat to warm up the space. And this floats over the meadow. And I wanted to show some of the sketching that we like to do. We, as we're building the little Part T models, we also like to do these experiential sketches where you really can kind of understand how people are going to circulate and how they're going to move through the building. What, what is that experience going to be like? And these really are not intended to be artwork. They're really intended to be studies to understand movement and experience. So we, we like doing these, these little sketch, sketch studies. And here's, here's the building on the, on the meadow. And the, the little framed view here is actually a framed view of Saddleback Mountain. And the, the uh, urban, when you look through this, you actually see the urban uh, context beyond in Saddleback Mountain. But as soon as you move anywhere else, you don't, you don't see that anymore. Um, little things like unexpected light quality. This, this is the kind of thing we, we, really, we really like. This kind of thing happening on our projects when we can get it to happen. Or interesting reflection, that sort of thing we like. So this is the labyrinth going after you've come into the entry. This next, next to it. And uh, actually, we you can we have um, a setup where projectors actually project on these walls so, so they can actually show um, imagery and then this the out spaces are also um, oh this thing's starting to go out on me maybe not I'm not going to panic yet um, the outdoor spaces were are intended to be very empty and very um, you know reflective and not not full of stuff that's that's on purpose so you can kind of reflect on what you've seen and this is the north side facing out facing out to the wilderness and and the displays are really intended to be portals that so there's a, a description and you stand and you actually can see um, you know some kind of feature that it talks about um, this is a current project that's under construction, um, one that we're really thrilled about. This was a competition that we won. It's a uh, design build format competition that we won. Borrego Springs, it's the context. And such a beautiful context, these, these incredibly dramatic mountains erupting out of this very flat plain of, a, of the desert coming in. We were thrilled to get this project. Our site is right near the, the dead center of Borrego. There's a, something called the Christmas Circle here, and we're one of the spurs off the Christmas Circle. And here's the site. Mountains is the backdrop. And some of the things that, you know, in the discovery process of the place, we started, we started looking around and the desert blooming 
is such an incredible event there that we we thought that we better we really ought to try to make that part of the experience. Uh, the night sky is is so dramatic there. Uh, it's it's astronomers go there and they just love it. So there's there is um, themes of astronomy that we're we're working with on this project. And then there's the um, the petroglyphs and some of the artwork that's on the on the desert floor that very very interesting things happening out there so the project really is um, an intertwining of a community park and the library so here's the library here's the community park and we we get the orientation really with this long axis that that really organizes everything and it's going to be the main walkway and as you walk down this in both directions, there are a series of frames that intensifies the understanding of where you're going and what you're seeing. And so we, we thought that the library and the park should be this intertwined composition. And we, we have some things going on that are kind of fun, like the idea of a spiral, which is the kind of thing you see when two galaxies come together and they start to dance, they, get, they go into the spiral kind of situation. Um, we have something called the Polaris Plaza with, with uh, a way to set up your telescope on true north, which is about like so. Um, we have a galaxy plaza here, which is a gathering place before you go into the library. And then you come out the other side and you're into the park. So. There's, there's a sheriff's facility that was part of this that it's a very, very minimal budget, but we, we were able to get it into the project over here. So again, process pieces. We, we uh, worked um, with Kelly Bauer and Jim Richard. Um, they, they brainstormed with us and uh, Kelly Bauer stayed on the project and actually did the interiors with us, which was Really, really fun, fantastic group to um, to collaborate with. And so we went forward with this project, and um, we found out that we were in the floodplain. So the early versions of this project, we were slab on grade, and then we we picked the whole library up, and we started studying. Okay, let's let the desert floor come underneath. Let's let the drainage happen underneath, and it. It took on a whole new line of, of understanding for us, and we started to like it more and more. So here's, this, this is actually the north side um, with these, these volumes actually are set on views. This is the entry in Galaxy Plaza, and you basically move through and out to the park going that way. Um, this is the poet's porch, that's the library name for this. And it's actually a really nice elevated porch that has a fantastic view off in this direction to the, to the east. And we were playing with this idea of um, an object on the desert floor. Now it's, now it's a hovering object on the de desert floor. It's picked up. And uh, this, this idea of elevating it, I think, was really nice because it gives it a, another level of importance as a, as a public place. So these, the, the ramp and the stair now move up, and they become more of an event. And so here, here's some of the diagrams that kind of set us on course. The community side of the library, the book stacks, and study areas, children's area here. And then this, this is this axis that, that really organizes everything. And along this axis, we actually are showing the planets of our solar system in their relative distances on the ground plane. And that's another, another little rich thing that happens. Um, this is a technique that we, we use quite a bit in the office where we are working with um, sometimes with SketchUp, sometimes with uh, 
rhino, sometimes with, with uh, Revit. But we pull, we pull the um, imagery out and then we color it um, with pastel. We just kind of do a check on, on materiality and color and backdrop and trees and all that sort of thing. We, we, we like doing this a lot. So it's kind of, kind of high-tech high um, check and low-tech check all at the same time. And this is the view of the library from the park going back. Um, and those frames that actually tell a story. And here it is. It's under construction. It's getting, getting close to being done. We're, we're thrilled about these horizontal framed views and these, these little portal views that are, are starting to happen. Uh, and this facade actually breathes. It, it, the air warms up here because it's facing south and it breathes at the top, lets out the warm air. And um, here are some of the, you know, it's, things always look better in black and white when they're under construction. I don't know why that is. But it's, it's, so we got some black and white shots here. But you can see how the ramp really becomes almost an event and as you move into the space. And we like this idea of circulation becoming an event and become, becoming something special and, and rich. We try to do that quite a bit in our work. Some of the views from inside. Here's the, the little portals that, that direct your view out to the, to the distant mountains. And these actually vary in height depending on the room. So these are for the um, teens and then they're much lower for the, for the younger kids. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop with this one. This is a competition that we did with um, Cal Poly students. And, um, and we also um, did it with uh, Bureau Happel, a very, very fine engineering firm. And uh, we, we found out that we did pretty well, but we didn't make the final cut. Um, so this is a cruise ship terminal at, in Taiwan, Kaishong Harbor. And probably you guys remember this. This is a few years back now. Um, and our thought was that this cruise ship terminal should really be this event on, on the waterfront and, and be something really special. And the, the ideas that we worked with was this idea of, of actually taking the moisture in the water, because there's a lot of rain there, and actually tempering it with the building and, and doing these, this water garden that actually intertwines with the building. And some of the massing uh, ideas is this, this linear piece is really the the place where the ships come and the, there's a moving uh, plank, gang plank that comes to the ship. This becomes the linear concourse that goes into the main structure. So this is really the terminal piece. This is the port office piece. This is the, the commercial area. And all of this is a skin that actually adapts to the sun and has PV built into it as well. So it's a building integrated PV. So this is the concourse, concourse space that's just, just inside where you get off the ship or you're waiting to get on a ship. This is the atrium space that's next to the commercial, commercial areas. This is actually the commercial side facing out to the city, and we we had this idea that this facade really could be an LED uh, dynamic facade with layers of glass and and uh, something dynamic happening here. Asia is about about this sort of thing. They love this sort of thing. And so here's a cross section uh, showing the program, the boarding concourse. The main main uh, arrival office and these 
these overhangs are really, because the sun is so steep here, a lot of these are actually functional and cutting off the sun to make this all um, indirect light coming in. And these are actually the Bureau Happel drawings that show, show how all these systems work. Um, so living roof here, PVs are integrated into the skin. Um, we're using the water of the harbor to, to actually cool um, with the chiller or pre-cooling the water that goes into the chiller. And these are the sun angles. Very, very different than here, as you can see. So we, we proposed uh, chilled, chilled beams throughout. And again, the, we relieved the warm, the, uh, warm water out into the, into the harbor. And so we spent a lot of time actually studying the skin. And the skin is really uh, a sandwich of glass, uh, punched punch screens that are serviceable. And then these, these little eyes that occur everywhere are, are PV panels. So it's this, this uh, it's almost like an animal skin with PV panels that goes over the whole, over the whole structure. And, th and this, was, this was actually developed by Cal Poly students, which I was pretty, pretty thrilled about, actually. Um, and then here's, here's the uh, port, port side of the building, an earlier rendering before we had that skin going, but still a pretty nice rendering. Um, I think I'm running out of time, but we, we did City College. So there's the model we did. I'll just leave it there. Are we, are we okay on time? I can keep going? All right, all right. So uh, we, we were fortunate enough to uh, do uh, the expansion of City College. And uh, we, we had some nice planning documents that were given to us. And we, we liked the thinking that went into that. So we, we, uh, we kind of did some elaboration on those ideas with these projects. And uh, so this one, this one is actually a general classroom building, but math and social sciences is, is the main occupant of this building. And there's a parking structure over on this side. Uh, but the idea is that this thing organizes around a courtyard, gets all its daylight from this north facing courtyard. Um, th these two buildings are um, making a quad, which is an elevated space up here. This is the Arts and Humanities building, and this is the Business Technology building. And then we did some remodel back here on this building. Uh, and this is a little black box theater that works um, collaboratively with the art, with the art program. And then there's a little gallery here. And then this mysterious space was our elevated uh, student commons that's essentially not enclosed it's it's open and and the air moves through it and they they've actually made it into a uh, a real classroom but it still has this presence as a as a a nice you know place to hang out and so um, we really really wanted this building to connect to the idea district and connect to the public realm so let's go back here the, the real connection is, is here and here to the public realm. So our, our dream was to have the sidewalk and the feeling of the city just come right into each, each of these projects. And, and fortunately, the city college folks did not want to close it down with gates, which we were very thrilled about. So um, a view from... Um, from a drone, I will confess it's a, it's a drone shot, <laughs> but it's kind of a cool one. Uh, it's almost the view you have from the freeway when you go by here. And this, this is the quad and this is the math and social science building. 
and uh, these these really are uh, controlling the sun and and um, really is working. Uh, someone took a really nice picture of the stair, but you know the stairs were really important part of of um, you know describing where you go to circulate and how you get to the building. So they really became the the beacons of of circulation. This is the uh, math and social science courtyard, but it's really it's really a daylighting exercise and a and a way to get to the entry. Um, but this terrace up here actually um, is used by the conference facility over here, just outside this this frame. And we thought it would be nice to build these buildings very permanently, so they're they're in cast in place concrete. Um, we think they're going to be a hundred year buildings, and we 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 were fortunate to have clients that wanted such a thing, and we. We really think they're going to last a long time, so we we let the concrete read, and then we did panels that really control the east and the west light. These panels. This is the other side of the street. The, the we call this the quad, and this one is a little little different riff on the structure. It's it has. A precast system along with cast in place, and the, we're letting the precast actually come out and uh, serve as a brisole to control the sun on the south. And there, there's a better picture of how that works. So these these become balconies, working balconies for the art arts students. And every once in a while, you'll go by and you'll see a sculpture happening or something is getting painted or whatever. Um, a lot of activity here. These are kilns. So this was really intended to be very industrial over here. Here's, here's the um, interior quad space. And it's, it, we tried very hard to activate it all the way around. So the big auditoriums actually spill out into the space. The gallery is part of the space. The cafe is part of the space. So it's generous, but there's there's a lot of activity going on there. So we're, we're pretty happy with, with how that's working out. The truth be told, uh, we love this place at night. When they do night classes here and the students are here at night, we, we just were thrilled with the character of this place at night. Just have to say it. Um, and these are the spaces at night and during the day, the art spaces. They're very tall, lofty, you know, lets, lets a lot of light, good quality light in. And here's the gallery, and it's got the same precast T system, just painted out. And I'll go back one. This is the precast T system. Each one of these is a T, and it's, it has a light source, so it reflects around the T. And then this is all a precast system here as well. Uh, and this is mechanical moving through here. And uh, truth be t told on this, we, we um, saw Bruder's library in Phoenix, and we, we liked it, and we used a lot of the ideas. I like to confess those things. Um, interior spaces, lots of concrete, thermal mass on the, in the hallways. So we, we did not condition these hallways. We allowed them to just naturally ventilate. And so all of our HVAC for this project is way, way less. It's 30% less because that's all circulation that's just naturally ventilated. So the energy savings on this project is, is dramatic. Here's the structural system. The precast T's, precast columns, the precast beams, and uh, this is taken where we don't have shear walls, but the shear walls are, are aligned along here. And for the people that are really into sustainability, I kind of like to walk through this. So this is really how we're controlling the south sun, allowing it 
to admit in the winter, controlling it in the summer. Um, we're doing um, passive, passive ventilation in the, in the corridors. And then we're doing um, a special kind of ventilation. Um, forgotten the name of it all of a sudden. It's terrible. Displacement ventilation. There we go. Thank you. Um, so we, we allow the cold air to come and fill up the space so that we don't start with cold air coming down. We start with cold air coming in at the bottom we, and we fill up the space with the cold air. It's very, very efficient. And we have raised floors. So all of those spaces that are within this concrete structure, there's a raised floor. They can all be changed in the future and, and moved around very easily. Here we go. Okay, I'm gonna stop it here because I think I'm running long. Yeah, I'd love to. Are we, are we okay for time to do that? Yes. I'd say one continual theme is survival. Um, seriously, we, I mean, and maybe, maybe there's more to that. I mean, we, we love spending time on these projects and, and uh, but we also have to pay the bills. So we, you know, we have to balance the, the effort and the time we put into these things with, with some kind of a profit center somewhere, you know, so that's, that's a continuing theme and we, we have to deal with it. But um, the brainstorming and, and actually allowing people to be the devil's advocate, you know, in other words, we, we like to encourage people to really critique and say, you know, what are you really doing with this project? Can you, can you tell us what you're working on? And what, what's the story, right? And um, if we don't have a story, it's, it's not a good thing. So. Usually that's a setback if we don't have a story. So that's a continuing thing right there, maybe. Is that a good answer? Or that's it? Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, he asked about the south wall and how it how it breathes. It's um, it's actually a core ten steel panel, core ten steel panel, and there's actually airspace behind it. So when it warms up, the air behind it can rise and warm up and then vent, and you're, it becomes that layer before you get to the actual waterproof membrane and it, it re-radiates the heat. So it actually works like a like an animal skin you know, in a way. I'm looking for a material that actually that application Ah, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Rob, for my column of person issue are very skid is with Is that better? Oh, <laughs> All right. Hopefully there's some carryover. Thank you. 
Thanks. Thanks, Ron. Okay, somebody's got to give me something hard. Yeah, I didn't give you anything. Uh, that was the softball. Yes. Okay, here we go. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yes. We. Thank you. Appreciate that. Well, I think that's a fabulous question. Um, yeah, I think there has to be latitude on all of these things, right? You've got to you got to be willing to let the project tell you what to do next, and but but you have to give some initial push to the project, and I think the initial push. Is the thing that I'm really interested in. Like, what are, you know, what is the site telling you? What is the client telling you? What are, what's the sensibility that you're, that's currently on your mind, or the, the thing that you've seen that really, you know, the latest Cohen movie, you know, Cohen Brothers movie, or whatever, you know, those those things enter in, and they're they're really, to me, they're not necessarily a concept. They're just they're, they're like uh, narratives that that weave together. And so a lot of times if, if you're forced with the concept, it's, it really can kill it because you're trying, to, you're trying to put a stamp on something that can't really have a stamp on it. I don't know if that makes any sense. Yeah. Yeah, yes. Okay. I think that's, I mean, to, here's kind of a glib answer to your question, but I think that's the thing that keeps us wanting to study that because it's, it's almost like an infinite study. Uh, and actually, I sort of agree with William Curtis that you do need a wall because light, light will move right through a space unless you stop it with something and allow it to reflect or allow it to bounce or do something else. You know, some of the most interesting light there is is the light that's already um, grazed a surface or it comes and actually reveals a texture or something like that, you know. So this, this thing, it's kind of infinite. That's why I love, I love it so much. And I, I'm always kind of thinking about it. So um, it's a glib answer. I'm sorry. I think, it, I think it's just we're constantly looking for the thing that you're talking about. Is there another way to admit light? into a space in a very, very uh, dramatic way or, or in a way that makes you um, like the space more or, or uh, enjoy the, the being able to perceive it in some way. It's a glib answer. All right.
Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, the glass thing is really interesting. We have, you know, every project kind of has a, its own, like, investigation on glass. Um, like, sometimes we want super transparency so you can really, it, like, there's no glass there at all. It's just, you, you see right in to the program, you see what's going on. And then um, going all the way to translucency, you know, different kinds of translucency. So um, ref the glass that actually reflects can be really interesting when you're, when you're near nature because it can actually um, make um, a silhouette or a mountain or a, a, a tree or whatever occur again on the facade. It can, it can replicate and mirror something that's already there. I don't particularly like mirror glass, but slightly reflective glass, I think, is really interesting. And yes, we do. Yeah. We think about it a lot. And when you think about the, this thing of light coming through and what it's going to be like at night, we spend a lot of time doing um, night you know, studies and renderings, see what, the, what it's going to be like. Very great question to ask, and we this was a uh, multi prime delivery method, so there was a construction manager and multiple uh, contractors had prime agreements with the owner. Um, what we did very early on is we engaged um, a precast um, specialist to to uh, design and produce the pre the precast. You know, we, we did sketches of what we wanted in terms of texture and, and connections and all of that, but they, they did the engineering um, and they became um, a selected contractor on the project. And this is going through DSA, so it was, it was very tricky to get DSA to accept a design build segment on a project that was going to go out for bid. That all had to be coordinated. Uh, but you, your question is is right in right in line. You know, we it took a lot of of us explaining the advantages and the cost savings to have to have the precast and the quality. You know, when you when you're dealing with precast, you could you can get the quality so beautiful that everybody was interested in that that level of of precision that you get with with uh, precast. Um, that was helpful on this, actually. Uh, you bring up a good point. So they delivered the T's. They, they basically erected the, the double T precast. Um, and, you know, it happened very, very quickly. And they didn't need a staging area because came in on a truck, a truck and they picked the T's off the truck and they put it right on the project. So no staging was, was needed. And uh, so I think it can be an advantage. Um, you have to have a sizable enough project to make it really cost effective. If it's a small project, it's probably not going to be cost effective. So you've got to have a lot of scope before it really gets cost effective. Yes. Yes. Uh, 
Um, I liked, I, I really liked the 70s when we actually did drawings and we, and, and the drawings kind of, be, you know, were built and um, I, I, I hoping that the pendulum swings all the way back there at some point. But to answer your question, we do like collaboration. We do like working with subs and, and uh, construction people to really, to really find out what's going on and what really makes sense. And, and many times their, their details are like the best, you know, that we've ever seen. You know, like we've, we've worked some, with some really good contractors. You, you know who they all are. But, um, but they, they can come up with great stuff. And so we like that. But we don't like any process that just turns into a continual argument of scope and budget and that's not in. And we didn't know that that was in. And sorry, you're, you're doing that. You know, it's just, that gets tiresome. You know what I mean? Yes. Yeah, I, the paintings that I showed were mine. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, that's part of, I mean, I, I just, I keep doing it as much as I can. Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah, 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 I like, I like doing, it's, it's, it's actually a very, it's a great media for architecture and I should be using it more in the architecture process, but I, I got comfortable with pastels and they're, they're quicker, you know, they're super fast. So I like kind of on the pastel kick right now, but watercolor can actually be, well, there's another one here. I, I stopped short, but there is one thing I want to show you real quick, if you don't mind. So there, this, this was kind of a beginning understanding of what the promenade should be on a high school project. And, you know, it's, it's, there's not a lot of detail there, but there's a sense of spirit there. So um, anyway, there's an example of how you can make that happen. Um, so it's, it's, it's handy um, every once in a while, and I think I should be doing it more, frankly. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Of course, you know, when you think about architecture and uh, how to create atmosphere, you think of the experience of, of uh, the sense of the spirituality or the, you know, the surprise. Or, I wonder if you have, you guys have elaborated more on what the concept of experience, what you want to do. Yeah, that's a great question. I would say something, something that's out of the ordinary, you know, maybe, maybe um, uh, I'm going to go back here, show something uh, that we didn't look at this project, but something, something like that. Whoops. Oh, come on, Ralph. Got it. Something like that. It's kind of unusual. Um, so I would say, to answer your question, maybe, maybe um, something unexpected, uh, um, a 
point of view or a, 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 a place that you can go where you see things from a, from a different, you know, uh, vantage point. Uh, you can interact with the spaces maybe a, at a raised level or a lowered level. Uh, and we're very fascinated with actually taking spaces down below and procession, procession down to a below grade project, which we're doing on a, on a middle school right now. But um, something out of the ordinary, maybe it gets you to think about space in a different way or circulation in a different way. And not, I don't know if we're saying we hope, I don't know if we can actually control more than that. Just, it's just something out of the ordinary. Because you know, I think everything else comes from the unique experience that you, you know, that everybody has, yeah. Okay, thanks. Oh, oh okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, okay. First of all, the obligatory school gift pack. Oh, thank you. Which has drawing. Wow, look at that. Oh, well, thank you. My favorite. And then my... one more. Oh, wow. Look at that. Temporary paradise. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. For all of you, there's food out here. Help yourself. Thanks for coming. By the way, we have lots of collaborators from our firm here. Can you raise your hands, all the people that collaborate with us? I just want to give give props to everybody that, thank you. Yeah, all right. Oh, I guess I gotta give this back to you.